The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins. He's a member of the Society of St. Pius V. He's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Very fine, Tom. Thank you. How are you doing this fine year? Doing well, Father. Thank you. Yes, that's right. We are uh, officially in the new year, new decade, even, here in the uh, 2020. Father, these are uh, certainly tumultuous times that we're living in. There's a lot going on, a lot of a lot of current events, and so I'd like to uh, run just a couple things by you and get your take on some uh, some current happenings in the world. One, uh, of course, has to do with Francis and this uh, hand-slapping incident that took place, I believe, on New Year's Eve and uh, in the Vatican when, when Francis was making his way to the nativity scene. Uh, apparently, one of the uh, woman members of the crowd as Francis was going along kind of shaking hands she just kind of grabbed his hand and wouldn't let go as he went to pull away uh, she held on and uh, Francis kind of very quickly was, was startled turned around slapped her on the hand a couple times kind of lost his composure for a minute and uh, there, this this incident has been getting a lot of a lot of press father so what is what is your take on this hand slapping incident well people are making much of that um, you have an elderly person who is going down the line greeting people and his hand is grabbed and the woman was obviously pulling him. Maybe she wasn't intending to pull him toward her, but she was just not about to let him go. Um, there's all manner of speculation as to what she was saying to him. She was in Asia, possibly China. Some speculate she was talking about what was going on in Hong Kong or going on in China with the church. Uh, the the modern church there, uh, under the uh, Communist Party. But in any case, uh, his reaction generated an enormous amount of press, right? Uh, because it uh, <clears throat> uh, was quite contrary to the, uh, the myth, the persona of his as being this very uh, grandfatherly and godfatherly sort of individual who was just... Uh, People with the poor who loved the smell of the sheep and all the rest, <clears throat> man of the people and so on. Uh, but when he's aggravated, he starts smacking people. It isn't the first time that he smacked at people. He didn't. Uh, uh, he didn't. He wanted to get away from. Right. Um, and of course, we remember last year the the uh, ring incident where he kept pulling people, pulling the ring away from people as they went to kiss the ring. So. Um, he, uh, he later apologized for it, and his apology was uh, kind of interesting. He said, well, isn't this typical of all of us? We all do this, and look, I do it too. So uh, his apology was a typical uh, leftist apology, I'm afraid. Well, you know, everybody does this, and I do it too, so I'm no exception. You know? um, I'm just one of you. I'm like everybody else. Um, but uh, nonetheless, it is rather disturbing to find a someone who's supposed to be the vicar of Christ on earth lashing out that way. I mean, it really was a matter of lashing out. And you can see in the cameras, the look on his face was one of real umbrage. Yes. I mean, he was angry, yes. uh, fiery, fiery angry. So um, it was mortifying uh, that anyone would see this as a supreme pontiff of the Catholic Church, anyone would see this as the Vicar of Christ lashing out in this way. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, popes traditionally, you know, haven't had tempers. They have, at times, uh, let those tempers show. But uh, I, the question, I guess, is whether, um, uh, in, in Francis's case, why doesn't he show that same fiery uh, temperament when it comes to our Lord being blasphemed and God's church being attacked and, uh, and uh, you know, sacrilege is going on. He's witnessed these things. He's promoted these things. He's even uh, uh, organized these sacrileges and blasphemies and uh, idolatries and so on. 
but uh, his anger seems directed always toward those who oppose sacrilege, who oppose blasphemy, who oppose idolatry. His choicest words of criticism and condemnation seem to always apply to the rigid ones who want to hold on to a dogmatic faith of, of uh, eternal truths rather than have a, uh, a constantly changing church that is constantly undergoing revolution and transformation. That is, that is where his anger seems to be uniquely and most ferociously directed <laughs> to those who uh, have the, the old traditional Catholic faith. Now, I don't know what the woman was saying. I could see what she was doing, I guess, in the video, but I, I don't know what she was saying to him. Perhaps it wasn't just her holding his, his hand, but what she was saying to him was really aggravating him. It would be interesting to know what she was saying. In any case, whatever his reaction was truly uh, mortifying. Mm -hmm. And um, he apologized, sort of, for it afterwards. Um, I, I personally did not consider that to be a worthy apology. The reason being is because uh, just as with the abuse crisis, the, the, the response was, well, you know, Catholic priests are no more likely to abuse children uh, than, any, than the rest of the population. And so that is kind of a, a left-handed excuse for saying, well, don't expect any more of us than you would from anybody else in the world. Uh, Catholic or not Catholic, layman or clergyman, you know, you can't expect anything more of our clergy. Don't blame us if we're human just like everybody else. We have the same faults. Don't expect anything more of us. And it sounds to me as if Francis answered in this case, came down pretty much to the same thing. Well, I'm just like everybody else, so, you know, uh, one can say that's an apology, but one can also say, let him who, is without, who hasn't done that cast the first stone uh, basically give me a pass on this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's essentially what he was trying to do, just kind of make it go away. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, well, Father, one one aspect that I uh, I thought of when when viewing this incident was, uh, you know, there's so many uh, would be traditional Catholics in the in the Novus Ordo Church, maybe the more conservative minded ones who are uh, just so incredibly patient, even to a fault when it comes to to Francis. You know, he he leads them uh, down this this road towards uh, liberalization of the Church uh, of his Novus Ordo Church, and they just kind of. Just go along with it, and no matter what radical steps he takes, they just say, "Oh, he's the Pope. We can't, uh, we can't go against them." And yet, contrast that with this attitude of Francis that I really think was manifested yeah. in this uh, this incident here, where the second one of his faithful um, literally tries to pull him in a direction that he doesn't want, he is literally ready to instantly just kind of lash out. So I thought it was interesting to kind of contrast those two. I thought it was, I think you're right, Tom. It is interesting to see that. Also, he has uh, tenders that he decided him. Sort of like Secret Service, you know, yeah. and why they didn't, yeah. maybe they did step in. I guess they did intervene somewhat there. But one thing you notice with him, he has a very low tolerance level mm -hmm. for the faithful who are crowding him. A very low tolerance level when they invade his space. And he has a very, very, very low tolerance level for anything that, that, that speaks of traditional Catholicism. Catholicism. Those are the things that bring the beast out of him. And uh, you're right. I mean, the 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 the, no, no, the new order conservatives have seemingly a seemingly uh, endless capacity for somehow spinning what he says, or explaining it away, minimizing it, or even condemning it, but saying it has no practical consequences. Whatever whatever it might be, they they just seem to always come back to the fact that well, he's our pope, and so we have to be respectful. Even if he's uh, spitting on the crucifix, or even if he's uh, denying Christ, you know, uh, we have to somehow find a way to uh, uh, not justify it, but minimize it, or at least say it has no practical consequences when it comes to the faith. Uh, so, um, but, uh, you know, th this is in stark contrast to Francis's manifest uh, impatience even beyond impatience, just a kind of a kind of a seething anger toward anything traditional, mm -hmm. anything of traditional analysis. And Father, I think it would uh, be interesting to see if anything more comes of this, and if anything is uh, found out of the woman that was involved in this, because a, 
apparently there, there are some who said, I'm not sure if this is on video or not, but there are some who say that the woman actually made the sign of the cross uh, immediately before she uh, kind of came up to, to Francis there. So mm-hmm. kind of a lot of uh, interesting things happening there. So we'll see what mm-hmm. comes of it. But, uh, well, Father, something else in the news um, is is this situation in, in the Middle East, uh, what's happening there with the bombings. Apparently there was a... Uh, kind of a, a takeover of, of one of the American embassies in the Middle East, and there's been a, a reaction here in the United States to that, and President Trump has ordered some airstrikes over there, and there's a lot of uh, controversy, a lot of debate surrounding the morality of that and kind of what mm-hmm. happens next, if it's going to trigger a World War Three or another endless war in uh, in the Middle East. So what, what's your take on all of that, Father? Well, there was a drone strike that was ordered by President Trump himself to... Uh, kill uh, the leader, I guess the top general in the Iranian military, right? um, who not only a terrorist ties, but is quite well known to be a director of terrorism, including terrorist acts against United States uh, American citizens, and uh, also beating him at the airport uh, when he landed was uh, a man who also similarly had very close t- uh, terrorist ties in, in with regard to militia work. And um, so they had their bodyguards. They were in two different cars, a, a total of, I'm not sure how many people, um, over a dozen people involved. And uh, I guess the, the lead car, the, the car that was uh, occupied by these two terrorist leaders, was struck by two missiles, if I'm not mistaken, and the second car was struck by one. All were killed. Um, in fact, it was a special kind of... Uh, missile that basically um, uh, just disintegrated the vehicles, right? Uh, They had to identify the Iranian general by a ring that was on his finger. They couldn't find anything else, you know, visible to to identify him by. But the question is, well, what we're talking about, what Catholics believe, we're asking, is this moral? Was this a moral act to do? Uh, was this a, a, an unprovoked assassination? Was there some justification for it? Uh, I think that, that very much depends on whether you consider them uh, to be a combatants in an actual war. I mean, is there actual warfare going on? And, uh, of course, there are those who insist, no, this man was a poet, and he was you know, a, a, a noble individual, as the Democrats and as the leftists and the progressives want to say in this country. And um, just as they wanted to say that Baghdadi was a, was a religious scholar and so on, they wanted to pass him off as this. The fact is, these men are involved in terrorism. We have plenty of evidence to that effect, of uh, at least the sources whom I trust, um, say that that is true. Uh, President Trump insists that it was true and insists that they were meeting to plan attacks on Americans. Um, and so he considers this, no doubt, to be a, a matter of terroristic war uh, that we're fighting and um, that it would be justified to, to do that. Now, there are those also, on the, on the right, if you want to call them that, libertarians and so on, who, who are denouncing that, I think Rand Paul denounced it. Um, is that correct? I think so. Uh, but, you know, again, the, the, the libertarians are all against our involvement outside of our country in, in drawing the acrimony of, you know, of groups outside the country and also foreign countries, too. Mm-hmm. They want us out of, out of all of that. And I can see the value of that. But the problem is um, that if there is actually a, 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 an actual threat, if there's an actual threat and there is an actual warfare, and meaning there are terroristic threats being launched, which are continually going on, and we have the evidence. Uh, in fact, I think, I think uh, uh, President Trump's uh, calling for this strike, as he said, was to prevent war, not to cause it. Uh, ever since Baghdadi was, uh, was killed, there have been attacks carried out by uh, terrorist Islamists to, uh, in protest and in, in retaliation, right? And um, 
So evidently, uh, President Trump thought that this was what was in fact being planned at that, at that time. He had the intelligence to convince him that it was true. Uh, of course, uh, they, well, Nancy Pelosi and Charles Schumer and the rest of them complained, and uh, who, who was it, uh, Schiff, right, complained that uh, Trump did not consult them or inform them. Uh, and he explained why that would have not been a good idea, of course. Um, so um, anyway, it, it's it, politically it's a it's a real hot it's a hot spot right now, <laughs> even a hot potato. But in terms of Catholic morality, if what we're being told that our intelligence has has made clear, has revealed to us, I think it was morally justifiable to carry it out. Okay. Um, all of those involved, uh, all of those who uh, were targeted, were involved in uh, the action, terroristic action, I understand. Um, so, um, either as a supporting cast or actual, you know, planners and directors of terrorism. So, um, personally, I, I do believe that it was justified whether or not all the dire warnings of those who say, now we're, we've really struck the hornet's nest and they're going to come after us, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, again, Donald Trump seems to think that we can make it clear to them that it's in their best interest just to uh, settle down. <clears throat> and uh, maybe a show of force is the only thing they understand, the only thing that works with them. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see how it plays out. Um, one thing we've seen is continual appeasement, continual negotiations, continual dialogue, which is what Francis wants, of course, uh, has brought us to this state right now. And um, every time we make an attempt to uh, stem the terrorism, we are accused of being the bad guys, and they come back at us uh, with a vengeance, literally. So... Um, uh, there, the arguments of those who condemn the drone strike, I think, are very weak myself, and I, I'm not convinced by them. Um, of course, the question here is Catholic morality. I, I do believe it was morally justifiable. Okay. Father, let's change gears a bit, if we can. I'd like to discuss a few emails. We have uh, a couple that uh, run along similar threads, and this, this first one here is from a viewer who says that he lived... For many years as a Catholic, I also became involved with Protestantism. However, he says, I abandoned everything, and today I consider myself an atheist. He says, I stopped believing in everything the Church teaches, the Holy Eucharist, the sacraments, uh, everything. Uh, one example he gives is, uh, he says, I asked astronomers about the false sun miracle at Fatima, and everyone told me that it never happened. The Catholic Church is over. In my city, there are LGBT groups taking possession of the parishes. Crazy. How could I make a way back to a church dipped in the trash? Do you respond to that, Father? Well, if he's making his way back to a church dipped in the trash, he's not making his way back to the Catholic Church. I mean, what he's talking about is the Novus Ordo, the New Order. Mm -hmm. He's talking about, uh, you know, the, the, the New World Order Church that came out of Vatican II. Uh, the laboratory of Vatican II, uh, and I would certainly not want him to make his way to that, okay? I assume that what he, I'm not sure what year he left, did he say? No. So I'm not sure when he left, um, but if he left the Novus Ordo, um, it would have been, you know, say in the 70s and the 80s, I suppose. Um, if he's talking about going back to what he left, and it was the Novus Ordo, now he sees how it's all played out, and the sordid and degrading consequences of modernism. And uh, no, by, by no means should he go back to that. He should go back to the traditional Catholic faith, the traditional Catholic practice, uh, which is certainly not dipped in the trash by any means. Um, the, the Novus Ordo has, in fact, trashed, so to speak, trashed the church. It trashed souls. And uh, there are those who are in good faith desperately trying to hold on get it, and trying to practice the Catholic faith, the traditional Catholic faith, even within the Novus Ordo. But they find out more and more that the position is untenable. 
that you can't practice the you can't legitimately practice the traditional Catholic faith within the Novus Ordo. There will always be sacrilege involved. <coughs> so all I, I can suggest to him is, uh, he says he considers himself an atheist. Uh, I don't know. There are a lot of people who claim to be atheist. It's kind of a catch-all term. And, um, um, you know, you, you find atheists who are... Um, not atheists at all. They have a very firm belief in God. They're just angry at God. You know, they don't like what the things that are going on. They want someone to blame, and they'll blame God. And so they claim they're atheists, but they're not at all. Um, but uh, I don't know what the case is with this with this man. <laughs> but I, I don't see how that what he's alleging here, would, what he's claiming here, would, would, would lead him to atheism, though. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just that he didn't like something, right. you know. Um, but that's not a, a thinking person's way of arriving at atheism. Because he goes, I don't like the way things are going, I don't like the way things are done, I don't like what's happening, and so I'm going to be an atheist. Um, it actually reminds me of an old, um, of a cartoon, actually. Uh, it was uh, Calvin and, and Hobbes, remember that, Calvin and Hobbes? And it shows uh, young Calvin uh, all decked out in, in hat and scarf and mittens and boots. And he's holding a sled under his arm and he's standing at the back porch. And he, he says, okay, let it snow. And it doesn't snow. And he says, come on, snow. And it doesn't snow. And he's getting a little bit aggravated here. And he says, come on, snow, 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 snow. And uh, it doesn't snow. And he does his little... Snow dance out there. He's yelling, snow, 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 snow. He's yelling, command, snow. It's time to snow. I want snow. Give me snow. No snow. And the last frame so shows him stomping off with the sign over his head that he's really, really angry and said, I think I'll become an atheist. <laughs> and unfortunately, I mean, what the, um, the, the writer, I forget his name right now, he's pretty well known, but he was actually using that, that particular construct to portray something that is so true, that we see happen uh, over and over again when it comes to people who profess atheism. And then they tell you why, and you say, well, this is not really a thoughtful, rational reaction. It is just an emotional reaction to things that I don't like. So, no, I don't know, with this particular writer, I don't know, uh, uh, and I don't can't, can't gather too much from what he's got written there. What it moved him to this uh, conclusion that he's an atheist, um, but uh, it, it'd certainly be interesting to sit down with him and talk with him about it, and try to find out what exactly his thinking is. But I, uh, if he's asking how can I return to the Novus Ordo, I would say, well, don't. If you want to be Catholic, return to the traditional Catholic faith. If you were there to begin with, come back to it. If you weren't there to begin with, come to it and find out what it is. Learn the truths of the faith. Embrace the faith. Practice the faith in the traditional Catholic religion. Mm -hmm. Not the Novus Ordo. Father, when he, when he says, uh, uses that phrase, dipped in trash, I mean, I, I think, in a sense, he's exactly right concerning the Novus Ordo. You know, there's the, uh, the garbage mass that you've, you've mentioned before. where the, uh, Philip and James Church in Columbus, Ohio, yeah, back in the 1980s. Yeah, and, yeah so... An actual I, garbage mass. And... and um, I think this is exactly one of the reasons why the uh, the Novus Ordo Church is so awful because it um, you know it, it causes people who who really don't know any better they think that this is the Catholic Church it really kind of stirs up in them a, a hatred for what they they think is the Catholic Church and then it kind of just uh, they'll they'll totally write off anything that uh, is they believe even associated with that so it's. Um, quite the, uh, the sad situation, but I'd say um, at least from the, the tone that I got from the emails that there is at least um, some sort of inkling that he would like to, you know, seek out and find the truth. So perhaps there is uh, some reason for hope. Here. Well, the fact that he's thinking in terms of returning to the church, as he knows mm -hmm. it, uh, indicates there's, there's something still stirring there. There's grace there, and I'm very grateful to God for that. And I very grateful to him for cooperating with that grace and following through. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but um, it, it is curious, I mean, if he said that he considers himself an atheist, but he's considering returning to the church, yeah. I suppose 
if you're an atheist, you could return to the Novus Ordo Church. <laughs> but then Francis says that as an atheist, if you, if you do good deeds, you can still be saved anyway. Sure. You don't need faith to be saved. Yeah. So I, I can see that he could find a place from that point of view in the Novus Ordo, but that clearly is not really what he's looking for. He wants true faith and the truths of the faith, and that will only be found in the traditional Catholic religion, yeah. the traditional Catholic faith and its doctrine. So that's what I would hope that he would follow through. I'd hope to hear from him again. Uh, I hope he's not offended by my reference to the Calvin and Hobbes <laughs> thing, but uh, it's just that uh, I've had a number of conversations in the course of my 40-plus years of almost ceaseless travel, it seems, with people who uh, you know, say that they're agnostics or atheists, and I find it very interesting to talk to them and find out what it actually means. And it, it, uh, it turns out it doesn't necessarily fit the word, the vocabulary mm -hmm. that they use. Uh, so. Well, uh, Father, I'd like to have uh, your answer for another email here from a viewer who says, If I came into the church through a Novus Ordo church, does that mean I'm not really Catholic at all? I converted from Protestantism in 2002 into what I was convinced was the Catholic church. So I'd like to have an answer to this question because I am confused. So, Father, if someone is uh, baptized, I guess he was in the Protestant religion and he came into the Novus Ordo Church, would he be a uh, considered a Catholic now if he wanted to enter now the traditional Catholic Church? Well, uh, curiously enough, I mean, does he say he was baptized by the Novus Ordo? No. Because all, all too often, I mean, uh, those who convert from ca some Protestant sect to the Novus Ordo are not baptized. Their, their baptism is just accepted automatically as valid, almost as though they're not really changing their religion, you know. Uh, they're just sort of changing a certain mode of practicing their... And, and someone who goes from the Protestant Church to the Novus Ordo might say, well, there's a very natural progression here because there was really nothing that prevented me as a Protestant from being part of the Novus Ordo, from entering the Novus Ordo. I didn't really have to change my belief that much, right? <coughs> That's what we hear from a goodly number of those who have made that transition, you know? Um, what would happen if, if the question is this, Tom, and you can tell me if, you, you know, you're reading this, so if the individual is getting at the point, well, if I wanted to be a traditional Catholic, would I have to then be conditionally baptized? Would I have to actually, uh, you know, formally enter the church? And the answer is actually yes. Pope Pius XII uh, required that. Pope Pius XII said, because we cannot have this confidence in baptism in Protestant sects, we have to at least conditionally baptize those who enter the Catholic Church. And we're talking the traditional Catholic Church. Because baptism is too, uh, too essential, it's too important uh, to p have put it at risk, you know. So we cannot assume that they use the correct matter, the correct form, and even if we can certify they use the correct matter and the correct form, we cannot uh, just defeat the concerns we have about their, or ignore the concerns we have about their intention. If they have a contrary intention <coughs> to the true Catholic concept of baptism, then that would invalidate their baptism in the Protestant sect. What if one were baptized in the Novus Ordo religion? Well, again, this because there are various priests who uh, just freelance or have a contrary intention. Uh, we actually received a videotape of a, the baptism of a child by a deacon in the Novus Ordo. And the deacon was saying to the people gathered there for the baptism that they used to believe, we, he says, used to believe in original sin and all that stuff. We don't believe in any of that anymore. You know, we're just welcoming little Walter here to the to the community. We're just initiating him into the group, into the society, you know, the church. Well, clearly, there's a contrary intention, a formal rejection of the church's teaching, you know. So there you don't find the intention to at least do what the church does. Even if the man used the, let's say, the, the standard, the traditional Catholic Roman rite of baptism and said the words in Latin, and even if and poured the water and all else was okay in terms of the matter and the form, 
That contrary intention is all the evidence you'd need that that baptism was not a valid baptism. And uh, Pope Pius XII is making the point, we, we can't have confidence now in the Protestant ministers. Note, we're talking back in the 1940s and here, and 50s, uh, that they don't have a contrary intention. So we have to at least have a conditional baptism for Protestants who are entering the Catholic Church. The tr uh, there was no other church than the traditional Catholic Church back then. No other Catholic Church, obviously. And um, also, Tom, in terms of converting from the Novus Ordo, um, if we find that you had the correct matter and the correct form applied, as is allowed, as is allowed for and prescribed, actually, in the new order rite of baptism, and we find that there is no question whatsoever about the intention of the, the, of the priest or even the deacon who did the baptism, we would not uh, gratuitously pronounce that invalid. Okay? But if there is any doubt about the matter or the form or the intention, if there's any real doubt about these things, yes, even from the Novus Ordo, we'll want there to be a conditional baptism. Okay. Now, somebody who's, who's uh, converted from a Protestant sect into the Novus Ordo uh, might not really be required to learn the Catholic faith. And so we found that it is necessary to go through the Catholic Catechism with them to make sure that they have a knowledge of Catholic doctrine. Um, and so, um, you know, again, one cannot assume that because somebody has entered a Novus Ordo, the, the Novus Ordo, that they have a, a uh, sufficient knowledge of the true teachings of the Catholic Church. So we do have to have a, uh, a program of, of teaching them and have them read the Catechism and make sure they understand it and believe it before they can be received into the faith. Okay. Then they have to make an abjuration of error, a, a uh, profession of faith, and a conditional baptism if they're coming from directly from a Protestant sect, if they have not been conditionally baptized in, uh, in the Novus Ordo or baptized in any way in the Novus Ordo, we don't even have that to look at. Um, but in any case, uh, we do find that there are those who come to us from the Novus Ordo. We do not automatically baptize, rebaptize, as it were, conditionally anyone who comes from the Novus Ordo. We look at it as, as a case by case basis. <clears throat> and there are Cases where they can establish the fact and swear through affidavits as witnesses that yes, the matter of the pouring of the water and the form, the, the pro proper words were said, and yes, this particular priest was very conservative and traditional in his belief before, during, and after the baptism. Uh, and he professed the Catholic faith about baptism. In a case like that, we would not. Okay. Uh, you know, expect a conditional baptism to be necessary. Mm -hmm. Father, my my wife and I were, were recently very blessed to to witness a baptism that you actually performed yourself here at Immaculate Conception Church just just recently on Christmas Eve, actually, of a uh, very very fine gentleman who was previously a member of the uh, of the Protestant religion and, uh, and now is baptized in the traditional Catholic faith, and it it really just struck me about the. Uh, the the int intricacy of it all and uh, kind of what, what you're describing here all, all of these these steps that are taken that is quite the contrast to uh to the Novus Ordo where if a, a Protestant were to enter the Novus Ordo church um there, there would be none of that well there it's just kind of a uh welcome welcome to the fold I mean there, there's nothing really uh serious that happens uh, so like you said there could even be an, an atheist who could just come right on into the Novus Ordo church and fit right in and there's nothing I think it's fascinating to contrast um, just how, how seriously it's taken, uh, this matter is taken. Well, Tom, not only did you witness this, you were the godparent, <laughs> godfather, yes. right? Yes. And uh, I know Jonathan uh, much appreciates that. You know, he, he specifically wanted you and uh, your noble wife, Hannah, to be godparents. Which is quite a uh, quite an endorsement, I would say. Um, but uh, Jonathan uh, was received into the Catholic faith, the traditional faith, of course. When I say the Catholic faith, I mean the true Catholic faith. Uh, on Christmas Eve, right, mm -hmm. received his first Holy Communion at Christmas midnight mass, yes. and it was very beautiful. I think everyone present there was quite 
you know, <laughs> moved by that. And uh, easily five, six hundred people were present. And um, and uh, just a week later, uh, New Year's Eve, I was anointing him in the hospital. And he is still in the in the hospital right now. It's determined that a a uh, an illness which he's had for, for going on ten years now, but which undetected, has kindly come to the finally come to the point now where he's he's gravely ill. Um, so I consider it providential that yes. he finally has come, found his way into the traditional Catholic Church, made his first Holy Communion, and uh, now in the face of this grave illness, is able to receive the sacrament of extramunction to help him physically deal with this grave illness that he has. So I ask everyone to pray for Jonathan. He's a he's a good soul. Yes. He he arrived uh, uh, on our uh, on our threshold here uh, as a chicken farmer, actually, okay. a chicken farmer from Tennessee, and um, that's all I knew of him. That he was a chicken farmer from Tennessee, uh, about thirty two years old or so, and um, I didn't realize his academic background. When he, he had been watching what Catholics believe, he had decided that the Catholic faith was the true faith. He'd begun reading. He'd read substantially through catechisms. Uh, and little did I know at the time that he could have read the, cath the Catechism of the Council of Trent in the original Latin that he wanted to because uh, he went back to Tennessee after our initial meeting and uh, said that every time he could get free from the chickens, he would come up and we'd sit down and we'd go through the catechism more to move him toward, you know, conversion. And lo and behold, um, when he went back to, uh, to the chickens, he sent his resume in. And I was extremely impressed uh, by his resume because he had advanced degrees and uh, degrees uh, from European universities. And he was obviously quite, a, quite the scholar, uh, speaks Latin, uh, classical Latin, and... Greek and certainly reads them, and uh, also French and Italian and German and uh, I believe Spanish too, and English of course, and uh, he's quite fluent I, I've discovered, and um, but he's also a violinist and uh, a keyboardist plays the uh, piano very beautifully and um, he has a trained tenor voice. And as all of these talents here, I had no idea. The chicken farmer from Tennessee had all of these, <laughs> these talents. And his, his background is also very interesting in many ways, in ter even in terms of horticulture and um, just agriculture. So um, he brought a lot to us. He's been teaching for us this past semester. But uh, I, I admire the job that he's done. He's done a great job teaching, and the students are very fond of him. I really appreciate it as a teacher, but he did it all while he was very ill. I didn't even know what was causing the symptoms of his illness. So with that, I, I just uh, thank God for the graces he's given to Jonathan, and I thank Jonathan for cooperating with those graces. And I do ask everyone to pray for him and his family, too. Definitely. Absolutely. Well, uh, Father, one more email that I'd like to get into, if we could. Uh, it's titled, A Response to Father Jenkins on Traditional Catholics and the Adult Mass. Uh, that, that is the title of a very popular video on our channel that you made some years ago. Father, we can link to that video here, I'm sure. And um, this viewer says, uh, it's a, a woman from California. She says that uh, she just finished watching that video. With all due respect, Father, I was upset by your tone in the video. She says uh, that you belittled, quote, would-be traditional Catholics, like myself. Uh, she says, Father, that you never really offered any kind of solution for those, uh, quote, would-be traditional Catholics who live in an area without a uh, Society of St. Pius V mass location. Uh, she says, Father, that uh, if the church was infiltrated from within to destroy it, Cannot the Latin Mass people and sincere priests who only dedicate themselves to the Latin Mass at least be given some credit for trying to infiltrate it back to tradition? At least we are willing to fight from within. You don't know our hearts, and for you to call us in a sense modernist is really uncharitable of you, Father. How would you respond to that? Well, I didn't call them modernists. I might have called them would-be traditional Catholics. But the, my point is, though, that as I said earlier in the program here, it's really impossible 
to legitimately practice the traditional Catholic faith within the Novus Ordo, uh, because it will ultimately always involve sacrilege of some kind. There has to be some kind of compromise made uh, where there is going to be sacri uh, sacrilege and uh, some kind of, uh, um, well, perhaps um, the, the dear lady, is it a lady? Yes, I think yes. This dear lady, um, I might have interpreted my words in the worst possible way, and maybe they came across that way. But um, my my point was that one should really free himself or herself from the Novus Ordo entirely. Mm -hmm. Modernism is, as St. Pius X described it, the uh, synthesis of all heresies. And uh, we have now in the Novus Ordo, the new order, uh, from the top down, we have modernists, and yes, they, they have all embraced modernism to some extent. All of them have embraced modernism to some extent, insofar as they have, uh, they're purveyors, purveyors of the Novus Ordo, right? They've gone along with the, the, the different sacraments and the marriage annulments and the initiation rite instead of, you know, actual, the sense of baptism uh, for what it really is. They've had to adapt their theology to the Novus Ordo and to modernist thinking. And so the, the, whole, the whole thing is, is at least, well, at the very least you could say it's very tainted. And uh, I mean, even, even those who are being held up today as stalwart opponents of uh, Francis's depredations on the church. I mean, here's, here's Francis, okay? He's actually in league with George Soros, uh, the Amazon Senate showed that, how closely they are in league with each other. So you, you could actually talk about the Francisaurus, sort of like, you know, you're talking about the, well, I mean, it sounds like the Tyrannosaurus, I guess. And I guess we could say the Francisaurus Rex with a W-R-E-C-K-S, because that's what we got here. We got the Francisaurus Rex attacking everything, uh, the church's social teaching and her, her dogmatic teaching and her faith and sacraments and so on. <coughs> so we have this, this monster on the loose here, which is modernism brought into, um, into league with uh, leftism and uh, socialism and really Marxism uh, in the Francis Soros uh, uh, alliance there. And uh, we have some cardinals uh, and some bishops and archbishops in the Nova Soros have spoken out against this. And so they are regarded as great champions of the faith. But they have been going along and, and actually not only representing, but promoting the Novus Ordo all this time since Vatican II. The new Mass, the new sacraments, the new catechisms, all these things, that has been their stock and trade, too. And they're very protective of that. Even to this day, they will not acknowledge that Vatican II really was a, was a, turn to the, a sharp turn to the left, and uh, took the church, uh, basically hijacked the church. Uh, the modernists hijacked the church in Vatican II. And so uh, they will not acknowledge that. Um, so I, my, my point is that modernism is the antithesis of Catholicism. It's not just anti-Catholicism. St. Pius X said it's the synthesis of all heresies. It's the exact negation of Catholicism because it takes the very word faith and redefines it to mean something that the church has never believed, never understood faith to be. It redefines the very meaning of faith itself. That's why St. Pius X says modernists strike at the very root, at the very root of the faith. They strike at the, the very virtue of faith itself and uh, falsify it. So until they're willing and ready to acknowledge, look, we've been off the track here, um, they can even tell us, I mean, in good faith, but we definitely now see that we've gotten off the track. And we now trace it back to, these, to the origins of this at Vatican II. Mm -hmm. And we realize now we have, to, we have to retrace, we have to go back there. We have to go back and, and, and resume the practice of the faith as it was at that point. That's my whole, that's my whole point. And this is what I wanted to get across to this dear lady. When she talks about fighting from the inside, I will tell her what I know. Back when this was happening, we were trying to fight it from the inside. And 
got nowhere. I mean, things were changed. We was just it was like Tiananmen Square with the with the um, with the tank rolling off over the protester there. Um, we we're incapable of, of withstanding it. Now, after twenty years from nineteen sixty eight to nineteen eighty eight. And since 1988 now, they are allowing the Latin Mass, okay, the 1962 version of the Latin Mass, they're allowing it under controlled circumstances in the Novus Ordo. For the first 20 years, they wouldn't even allow that, okay? But their whole purpose was to gain control over it and to gain control over people like her who still had the faith, but keep them in the Novus Ordo and keep them supporting the Novus Ordo. So, again... If you are inside the Novus Ordo trying to work from within, you're still in the Novus Ordo. And you are still contributing to it. And you're still basically saying it is Catholic. And if you believe it is Catholic, then that's what you should be doing, the Novus Ordo. If you don't believe it is Catholic, you shouldn't be involved in it. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be affiliated with it. And you shouldn't be representing it. You have to decide whether, which is Catholic and which is not. Mm -hmm. I gather... From what she says there, maybe she really thinks that the Novus Ordo really is Catholic. Maybe Brand X, maybe an off, off brand of Catholicism, but it's still Catholic enough that she can still find her niche in there, uh, allowing her to practice the traditional Catholic faith. I would, I would disagree with that and say no. Uh, it is not Catholic. It is purveying a modernist religion to represent the modernist anti-faith and if we realize that if we understand that to be true we can't have anything to do with it well father if i may paraphrase and, and try and summarize the rest of, of her email and really i think uh, her comment, it looks rather lengthy it, it, it is <laughs> but uh the uh the, the point that that she's making here i really think is um one of the most if not the single most um common question that that we receive and uh the point is this that uh you know, conservative Nova Soto Catholics, they may agree to a certain extent uh, of what you're saying when you, you know, you uh, expound the the damages that Francis has done to the to the church. They will, uh, many of them agree with you to some point. However, they say that uh, <coughs> this is the only option that they have. There's nowhere else for them to go. This viewer says she lives in California. How many truly traditional Catholic priests like yourself are there in, in California? She says... You know, you talk about the Society of St. Pius V. Well, she says in 37 years of a society, uh, there, are, there are only locations in 14 different states. There are not uh, seminaries or uh, many seminaries or, or many, many places for would-be traditional Catholics like herself to, to attend a Society of St. Pius V Mass. And so their only option, it seems to them, is to try and attend their local diocesan Latin Mass and fight it with, from within. But she might consider that to be a lesser of all possible evils. But the lesser, or the least of all the evil options is still an evil. And we shouldn't accept that as standard operating procedure. So what should she do? So if she considers that home? to be standard, the standard which she's going to go by, and she doesn't try to escape that to a, a better option, shall we say, then that would be a mistake. If, if one sees something as a compromise, one might, might justify that under the circumstances. But to say, okay, this is a compromise, I'm going to make this my standard, the standard of my behavior, and I'm just going to accept this as the best possible circumstance and the only press possible circumstance, that's not, that's not good. That's, that's a bad thing to accept a compromise and make that the standard operating procedure. I think that's what people are doing with the Society of St. Pius X right now. I think they see that the Society of St. Pius X is in a compromising position, a compromised and a compromising situation with regard to the modernists in the Vatican. And there are those who want to make that their standard now. That's dangerous, to make a compromise your standard. Um, but if she, if she knows for a fact that the, if she can establish the fact that the clergyman who was offering the Mass, okay, the, the traditional Latin Mass, even if it's a 62 version, right? If she knows for a fact that he's validly ordained, that he does not say the Novus Ordo and, and, and is not connected with the Novus Ordo and, and not practicing the Novus Ordo, let's put it that way, um, 
then she, and and he practices only the traditional Catholic faith, and he holds only the traditional Catholic faith. She might be able to justify going to him, but she has to realize, though, that officially she is accepting what the Novus Ordo stands for, in the sense that if he is a clergyman of the Novus Ordo, uh, I mean he's connected with all of the evils of the Novus Ordo. Officially speaking, he is a part of that. Uh, all of the marriage annulments and all the rest. I mean, he's, 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 there are things that he has to go along with. And so this dear lady here might say, well, I don't accept all those Novus Ordo marriage annulments because I know they're wrong. I know they're just condoning adultery. But she may be, if she goes to this Novus Ordo, if she goes to the Invalid Mass in California, she might be kneeling next to people who have been married and, and uh, annulled and married and annulled she might be kneeling next to him two or three times. And if that's the case, what argument would she have? I mean, this is all within the Novus Ordo here. Um, and uh, not only that, but formally speaking, she'd be in communion with people like Hans Kuhn and so on, who deny the faith outright. She's also going to a liturgy where the clergyman says explicitly that he is one in faith with Francis. Now, she might not say that she is one in faith with Francis, but the fact is, that liturgy is being offered one in faith with Francis. That's what's being said at the altar just before the consecration. So um, these are things that someone in her position really needs to, needs to consider. Um, and look for, look for, another, look for a, a more Catholic way. I understand. I mean, I don't mean to sound hard-hearted about this whole thing in the sense of saying, well... Fie on her, you know, she's doing all these things and it, it's of no avail, avail to her and uh, no benefit. I'm not saying that. I'm saying she's trying to be Catholic under adverse circumstances. It's like trying to survive with no life support equipment on the moon. And, uh, I mean, I admire, I, I do, I say this without hesitation, I admire someone like that who's trying to do the best they can under the circumstances. I think that is truly admirable. Um... I do believe that the situation will become untenable for her as time goes on, and I just want to kind of warn her about that. But there are certain things she has to at least uh, be sure of, and that it's a valid liturgy, a valid mass offered by a valid priest who has the Catholic faith and doesn't practice the Novus Ordo religion. Uh, baseline, absolute necessity, right? Um, <coughs> but I, I do believe that, that as in the course of time, as she sees more and more a compromise, she's going to realize, I can't, I can't do this. I, I cannot continue this way. I have to find a true traditional Catholic priest to go to. So <clears throat> I would advise anybody in her position to be aspiring to that, working toward that, trying to uh, make that happen and as soon as possible to find a way to get to, uh, to a true traditional Catholic Mass offered in a true traditional Catholic chapel with a true traditional Catholic priest and one who's not compromised by the Novus Ordo or compromised with the Novus Ordo. Mm -hmm. We find that conservative Catholics are in a very dangerous spot right now. Uh, we find that they are in their own, that they are trying to resist Francis, okay? This recognize and resist business has actually affected the, the uh, conservative New Order Catholics. They see that they ha they're recognizing him as the Pope, but they're resisting virtually everything he does. Okay, But this has gotten them so nervous about being disrespectful that they have to stop every now and then say, but we do, we do accept his Holy Father, and we do respect him, and we do revere him. And then they go back to saying, but what he's saying is horrible, what he's saying is heretical, what he's saying is blasphemous, or sacrilegious. And, and so on. And uh, here's the problem, Tom, I mentioned it before, that as they try to stay with the Novus Ordo, within the Novus Ordo fold, and they try to stay on the good side of Francis, if there is a good side of Francis, um, and his bishops, um, they, their faith is being affected. Their faith is being undermined as they're doing this. Their very concept of the papacy is being affected by Francis. Francis is actually changing their faith, and they don't even realize it. There's a certain Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, who's a conservative Novus Ordo writer, 
again, one of those. It was, it says Francis is the Pope. The whole Pope had nothing but the Pope, and there's nothing you can do about it. And we just have to realize that and accept that fact. Even if we see him as a heretic, it doesn't change the fact, right? He, he says, and you can't even question that, despite what St. Francis de Sales says and what St. Robert Bellarmine says. He just says, no, you're not allowed to think, to do what they say. You know, you, you can't, don't, don't listen to them. He's one of those. And he, he has actually come to the point now where he's saying that the problem that we're experiencing now began not with Vatican II, but with Vatican I in 1869, 1870. There was the problem. Well, of course, what, if he is thinking the way he's thinking as a conservative Novus Ordo who can't even accept the possibility that Francis might not be the vicar of Christ on earth and might not be the supreme pontiff of the true, true traditional Catholic Church, if he cannot even accept that possibility, then he's going to have to start questioning everything else eventually, right on down the line. And now he's questioning the wisdom of the First Vatican Council under Pope Pius IX of defining, you know, the, the doctrine of the infallibility of the Pope with the, uh, the statement of that infallibility, with the, the uh, actually what that did was it, 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 it defined the, the meaning of the extraordinary magisterium of the Church with regard to the Pope himself. The council, general councils or ecumenical councils are also a work of the extraordinary magisterium of the Church. The Pope defining ex cathedra is a, an example of the extraordinary magisterium of the Church at work. And he's, he's arguing that those at Vatican II who are saying it's not opportune might have been right because Maybe Vatican II defining the infallibility of the Pope under these very narrow set of circumstances. Maybe they set the stage for Francis by drawing so much attention to the extraordinary magisterial authority of the supreme pontiff of the Church that it um, drew everybody's attention away to that and made them forget about the infallibility of the ordinary magisterial of the Church. So he's actually now, again, trying to figure his, find his way through what is really a, a, a conundrum, an enigma, a dilemma in his own mind. And all because he cannot come to grips with the fact that uh, there is a serious doubt, an, an objective doubt about the, uh, the legitimacy of Francis as, as a pope. Um, it, it will necessarily lead to false conclusions and lead them down false trails, and it will affect their faith. This is what I, where I see the conservative New Order Catholics who want to be Catholic and to have the Catholic faith and want to practice it in its integrity. That's where I see the danger is for them now. And the next step, I fear, is that somebody's going to say, well, let's do this. Let's come up with some kind of a, a hybrid between traditional Catholicism and the modernist changes. Let's make some sort of a, a special rite of Mass and sacraments, which is a kind of a Frankenstein uh, uh, assemblage of elements of, of the, the modernist changes and the traditional practices of the faith. And there will be many of who will say, oh, this is wonderful, this is just Catholic enough for me to accept it. That would be the worst possible thing to happen that I, that I think. Uh, I think because it would just, it would still be modernism. It would still have the principles of modernism behind it. And it would ultimately lead to the same point, the same conclusion. The only solution that I see, and this is the result of the years of my working as, as a Catholic, traditional Catholic seminarian and so on, and my point of view has changed over time and uh, developed over time, uh, really, it's, it's come very perfectly clear to me. The only way to uh, really resist the modernists is to be fully traditional Catholic and not to be uh, part traditional and part modernist because that is a contradiction in terms and will drive one mad. It certainly will drive one away from the faith. Mm -hmm. Father, one, one final point on this whole question of the uh, conservative. <laughs> conservative you know, sort of Catholics or the would-be traditional Catholics is that, you know, they're, they're so uh, 
ready to question um, how how we say that you know so many the the Novus Ordo uh, ordinations are are doubtful. Um, you know, like like she says, the uh, Society of Saint Pius V. Uh, it, it's so sparse relatively. It's only in uh, relatively few states, relatively few mass locations. How can this be? How can this be? Uh, and I would say, well, before that question is asked of us, is asked of you in the Society of St. Pius V, uh, they would have to address that question to St. Paul because he, he said it's in sacred scripture inspired by the Holy Ghost that there would be at some point in time a great apostasy, a great a falling away uh, from the faith. So I think rather than, than question, how can this be, how can this be, when we know that this uh, it fact, must come to it, that at it, some point it, in history. If, if this is not that time right now, then we know that time is going to come at some point. So mm-hmm. we should not be so surprised uh, to see something like this. But rather instead, what we should do is what, what we read in, in the Gospels, I believe in the, uh, the the first weeks of Advent, is that we should flee to the mountains. We should mm-hmm. flee to Mount Calvary. We should find where there really is a true traditional Mass. And like you said, we should work our way towards that. So rather than kind of... Uh, staying out in the desert, in the closets, uh, as the gospel says, we should flee to the mountain. We should find where there is a truly unquestionable traditional Catholic mass and flee to that mountain. Exactly, Tom. At the time of the Arian heresy, St. Jerome wrote that 80% of the bishops at that time, in his estimation, were Arian heretics. (laughs) Now, if she would have written to St. Jerome and said... Well, this is the best I can do in my diocese ruled by this Arian heretic here. So I'm trying to practice the Catholic faith within this Arian milieu. And yes, I mean, 80% of the priests here are modernists and, and Arians and so on. Uh, what St. Jerome have said, just, well, just hunker down there and try to be as Catholic as you can. No. Where you are, when, under the circumstances, what do you say? Try to escape your Arian bishop. Try to escape your Arian... Uh, clergymen, you know, and and come back to where where there are traditional, true, fully Catholic priests and bishops. Uh, we know Saint Hermenegild, whose feast day is April thirteenth, uh, was imprisoned by his Arian heretic father, the king, who sent him an Arian heretic bishop to give him Holy Communion on Easter Sunday, and Hermenegild, Saint Hermenegild, would not receive communion from the Arian heretic bishop because he would not be in communion with them for which cause his father had him mur- martyred. So St. Hermenegild is now a martyr of the faith, and he set that example by refusing to be in communion with the enemies of the church, the many enemies of faith, the enemies of Christ. So this is the example the church has given to us. I, I just caution someone in her position, even though I, I, I tell them, I, I know it's a very terrible position to be in, it's an awful position to be in, um, that, and I understand that she's trying to do the best thing she can under the circumstances as far as she knows what that is. I just wouldn't want her to consider that to be standard operating procedure as though this is uh, the best she should ever hope for and the best she should ever work for and just accept this as normal. And it is not normal for a Catholic to be in that situation. And to the extent that it is not normal as Catholic, it is not acceptable as Catholic to accept, to, to simply... Uh, take that as uh, the all that can be accomplished here. She has to be really looking to escape the Novus Ordo entirely. You know, uh, Tom, one thing that didn't come up here in this this uh, night's talk here, <laughs> and I know we <laughs> want to move along, is uh, the danger that this country is in, our own country, with this impeachment process. Um, and... Um, I mean, it has come to the point where people are already talking about um, the upcoming election during, in the course of this year, as uh, resulting in in even civil war. This is very concerning, a very great, great concern for us. And yes, there are matters of morality and Catholicism involved in this. I just want to stress the need for prayer, you know. Uh, we have to pray for our country. We have to pray for our, our country's uh, our country's leaders. We have to pray for those who are good and against those who are bad. There are those who have been, uh, you know, telling me how horrified they were to see the congressional process against President Trump, and how that that has so uh, I would say disheartened them to see 
these uh, the chicanery and and the what else can you say? But I just remind these people that this is exactly what you expect from those who make abortion their go-to policy to gain votes. They have sold their souls to Planned Parenthood. What do you expect from them? This is standard operating procedure for them. So we cannot allow ourselves to be surprised and therefore disheartened by the corruption that is there. Um, we, we have to, um, rather than fuss and, and, and sputter and, and complain, we really need to direct our fervent prayer to Almighty God that he deliver us from this captivity. This is worse than any Babylonian captivity. Um, and we have to ask that God protect uh, our, our true leaders, who are trying at least to, um, regardless of their own personal moral status, we know the problem there, uh, are, are trying to at least uphold the natural law publicly. At least that. We have to pray for them, that God will protect them. Not only protect them physically, but protect them spiritually against evil influences and the tendency to try uh, to, to appease, okay? Um, so I, I beg the people during in the course of this year now, we, we, we have a situation where they've, <coughs> they've gone through this process of pr producing these impeachment articles, right? Uh, which uh, this uh, outstanding uh, Novus Ordo Catholic woman, Novus Ordo, I say, Catholic, no, uh, will not, you know, as the, the head, uh, the Speaker of the House, will not send these impeachment articles because she wants to control it. Uh, she has, she has this, this, this mania for absolute control. God help us if she ever uh, gets, you know, the reins of government in her hands. Um, but um, we see this, this sparring now between the two, um, uh, the two houses, the, the House, uh, the Congress and the Senate, right? Two houses of Congress, and what's going to happen there, we don't know. Things are really up in the air with our government right now. And we are in a lot of peril. So we have to uh, make it a priority during this year to live our faith and be totally faithful to our Lord. Put away any habits of mortal sin. Realize uh, that Our Lady was pleading with his uh, Fatima to give up the habits of mortal sin, especially the sins of impurity that so offend Almighty God. And uh, we have to learn to pray as Catholics should. That means, in, through the traditional Catholic Mass, is the holy sacrifice of our Lord at Calvary, offered on our altars, and we have to learn to pray the rosary devoutly, and really pray it, not just say it. We have to learn to pray that rosary. Um, and we have to... Uh, we have to try to also be um, emissaries of our faith. We have to go out and not be timid about our faith. We have to be very bold about our faith and our belief. And uh, look for all those souls out there who are wandering, who are looking right now. We mentioned Jonathan, right? And there's so many others like him out there, too, who just need a clear voice like the sound of the trumpet that they can follow they can hearken to. Well, each one of us should aspire to be that this year. Definitely. Well, Father, thanks, thanks for your time. I, uh, I appreciate it. And uh, I, I know that all of our viewers, and myself included, would like to wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Blessed New Year to Well, you. I, I return that wish for all concern. Uh, blessed Christmas time. Lasts until February 2nd, as everyone knows, right. or should know. And uh, on a very blessed coming year, too. Thank you, Father. God bless you, Tom. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and finally to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.